Now, if I told you that our evening keynoter was the founder of a Silicon Valley-based software development firm and had 25 years' experience in computer design and software development, if I told you he was a leading expert on the robot revolution, how about if I told you that he was a global expert on artificial intelligence in general? What better way to end a day where we've had so many ideas and so many practical implementations, more or less where we began with my kind of lightning keynote, which is on the notion of augmentation. How can we use all of this, maybe, technology to do things, extraordinary things? How about AI? Let's give it up for Martin Ford, who's going to explain to us the rise of artificial intelligence. Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, over the past five or six years, I've been thinking a lot and also writing a lot about the potential impact of artificial intelligence and robotics and similar technologies. And I've really come to the view that we could well be on the leading edge of just a massive disruptive wave that I think could put a terrific amount of stress on society and also on the economy. And the central idea, of course, is that smart machines and algorithms are increasingly going to substitute for workers. They're going to take over more and more of the work in the economy that's now being you know, done by people who are, who are paid to do that. Uh, and uh, one of the really remarkable things is how much visibility this subject has gotten over the past few years. When I wrote my first book on this topic, back in 2009, this was really completely off the radar. It would have been considered almost a, uh, a lunatic fringe type idea. Uh, but now that there's just a dramatic amount of visibility. It's hard to go online or, or you know, look, look at the press without seeing something about robots and artificial intelligence and very often the potential impact on the job market. There have also been some formal academic studies done uh, most notably by a couple of researchers at Oxford University, and they looked at countries like Germany and the United States, developed countries, and found that potentially 30 to 50 percent of all the jobs in the economy could be susceptible to automation over the next couple of decades. Now, if those estimates are even close to being true, then that would be just a staggering impact on our society. Uh, in, the, in the years since I wrote my first book back in 2009, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of people who are deeply engaged in these technologies. In other words, people doing the actual research into artificial intelligence and robotics. And what I found is that a great many of them generally share my view that, that we're headed toward this disruption. So there is something of what you might call an emerging consensus on the technical side that, that we're really heading into an era that's going to be quite different in terms of the relationship between people and machines. On the other hand, there is also a lot of skepticism out there. And I think it's fair to say that, as a rule, economists tend to be quite skeptical that we're really entering something that, that is really remarkable different. Uh, you know, economists never really want to believe that this time is different, and yet I think that we are quite possibly headed into an age of dramatic change in terms of this technology. But the skepticism tends to be anchored in the historical narrative. Uh, this idea that machines might displace workers and potentially create a, a lot of unemployment goes back at a minimum 200 years to the Luddite revolts in England. And since then, it's, it's come up again and again. In my most recent book, for example, I tell the story of the Triple Revolution Report, which is actually a, a very formal report put together by a very prominent group of people, including two Nobel laureates. And it was presented to the President of the United States at that time, President Johnson. And this was 50 years ago in 1964. And this report predicted that the United States was on the edge of a major disruption. The technology would upend the economy, would create massive unemployment, primarily because of industrial automation. People would be out of work, and the economy would go into free fall, and there would be social upheaval. And again, this was 50 years ago. Obviously, that did not come to pass. And what we've seen is that again and again, that's what happens. There's an alarm raised, but it turns out to be a false alarm. So I think that this topic has quite a lot in common with the, the old story of the little boy who cries wolf, 
Um, in that story, of course, the false alarm is raised again and again, and, and the population becomes complacent. They become skeptical. But it's important to remember that in the end, the wolf does show up, and I think that that may be where we're, we're headed with this issue, and as a result, a lot of people are simply going to be unprepared for it. Uh, this is a topic that sits at the intersection of economics and technology, and economists never really want to hear that this time is different. They're always very skeptical of that, and yet in the realm of technology, this time is always different. That's the whole point of innovation, that you're always trying to move from where you are to somewhere that you've never been before and, and create something dramatically new. And so I think one of the most basic questions we can ask about this is, is this really a, a topic that's primarily about technology or is it one that's about economics? And I tend to come down on the technology side. I don't think that there's any rule of the universe or of economics even that says that people will always have to be part of the loop. It's very easy to, for me to imagine a future where technology and machines take over more and more of the work that needs to get done in, in the economy, and as a result of that, there are fewer uh, opportunities for especially people with average skill levels. So given that, I think that can be quite a dramatic uh, impact. So what I'd like to do is start off by giving you just one number that I think is quite suggestive that perhaps something quite different is really happening. In 1998, in the business sector of the US economy, as measured by the government, there were a total of 194 billion hours of labor performed. Now, if you fast forward 15 years to 2013, it turns out that the business output uh, grew by about 42% or three and a half trillion dollars. And over that same 15 years, the population of the United States grew by 40 million people, which is, you know, that's roughly the, the population of the United Kingdom. So that's a huge number of people to add to our population over that time. But it turns out we get to 2013 and the total amount of labor required by the US business sector was exactly the same. It didn't change at all. It was still 194 billion hours of labor. In spite of that massive increase in output from that sector and a massive increase in population, there was simply no new work at all created. So to me, that's pretty suggestive that, that something interesting is happening. And I think what's happening is, is largely about digital leverage. It's about businesses using information technology in ways that allows them to just be dramatically more productive and efficient. And I think that that really shows us the way things are likely to evolve in the future. So if I'm gonna argue that this time is genuinely different from what we've seen in the past, I think it's really important to articulate what exactly is different about today's technology relative to what we've seen in the future. And I would point to three things. The first thing, of course, is that we have this exponential acceleration going on. I think everyone is now familiar with Moore's law and the idea that computing power doubles roughly every two years or so. But obviously it's, it's much broader than that. It's not just about computer hardware, it's about computer software in many cases. It extends to communication bandwidth and so forth. So we've got a very broad-based acceleration going on. But the important thing to really take note of is that this acceleration has now been going on for a really long time. It's been going on for decades. Uh, if we measure from when the first integrated circuits came into being back in the 1950s, we've seen at least 27 to 30 doublings in computing power um, since then. And that's really just a, an incredible amount. If you imagine, for example, getting into your car and starting driving along at five miles per hour and then gradually doubling your speed, if you doubled your speed just a handful of times, you'd need a racetrack and probably a better car. If you could double your speed 27 times, you would be a spaceship. You'd be traveling at millions of miles per hour you'd be able to get to Mars, for example, in just a few minutes. And that's sort of where we are in terms of the absolute progress that we see um, because of this ongoing acceleration. And, and it's one of the reasons, I think, that things are likely to unfold at a very surprising rate. We're, we're likely to be taken by surprise by a lot of the developments that we see in the coming decades. The second thing that I think is really important is that information technology now delivers, at least in a limited sense, machine intelligence. Machines are starting to think to some degree. They are making decisions. They are solving problems. Most importantly, they are learning. And I think that of all the things that we talk about, the technology that is really central to this and is really driving it is machine learning. It's this idea that we can have now smart algorithms which churn through data and based on that data can learn and make predictions. And that's something that 
I think has the potential to, to scale massively across the whole economy. Uh, you, you can think, you know, in terms of the number of jobs that are likely to, to be impacted by that, uh, one way to get a handle on that is to ask yourself, could a particular job be done by another smart person if that smart person had access to a detailed record of everything that a particular worker has done in the past. If, if a smart person could figure out how to do that job based on studying that record, then I think it's a pretty good bet that eventually there'll be a smart algorithm that will uh, take you know, essentially the same approach. So when you think of it in that sense, it's just an enormous number of jobs, and that's why you've seen these estimates come from the academic world that, that suggest it might be 30 to 50% of all the jobs in the economy. Uh, the third thing, that's really important to note is that today's information technology has become a true general purpose technology. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. There isn't any part of the economy that's not gonna be impacted by this. And as a result of that, there isn't any safe haven for workers. This is something that is going to impact every industry, every employment sector, every business, every organization. It's simply going to be everywhere and across the economy, every business at every level is gonna really start leveraging these capabilities. So when you put these three things together, I think what you end up with is something that looks essentially like a utility. It's almost like electricity, except that rather than just delivering electric power, it's actually delivering machine intelligence. And that intelligence is gonna scale across organizations, across the whole economy, and one implication of it is that it's gonna make everything less labor intensive, and it's gonna mean fewer opportunities for human workers, and in particular for what we may think of as average people with average skill levels. So one of the things that, that people who are still skeptical about this will point to is the classic historical example of technological disruption, which is the mechanization of agriculture. The skeptic will say, look, in the United States, for example, there was a time when most people worked on farms. Now the number of people working in agriculture is less than 2%. Clearly that did not turn out to be a bad thing. It turned out to be a very good thing. Uh, food is now much less expensive in, in, in real terms relative to our incomes. Uh, people did find other work. They moved on to other things that were actually more fulfilling and in many cases offered much higher incomes. And so it was all really a very positive story. So the skeptic would say, why isn't that going to happen again? Isn't it just gonna be the same story, the same kind of adaptation? And I, I would point out that I, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that, as I said, information technology has become a general purpose technology. The technology that transformed agriculture was not. It was specific, it was mechanical, it was specialized to the agricultural sector, and it did in fact transform that particular sector. But when that happened, there were all these other sectors of the economy out there that were equipped to absorb all those millions of workers. So we saw, uh, for example, a rising factory sector and people moved from agriculture, they crowded into cities and they eventually found work in, in factories. Later on, of course, uh, manufacturing also automated or to some extent it offshored and then in advanced countries, people have now transitioned to the service sector and that's where most people work today. But what we see today with today's information is technology is gonna hit all those sectors simultaneously. And I think that in advanced economies, especially the most disruptive thing that's gonna happen is gonna be when all of this artificial intelligence and robotics gets leveraged in the service sector because that's where nearly everyone works now. Uh, so uh, another important point is really about the nature of work. And one thing that's really important to understand, I think, is that most people in our economy, if you think of our workforce, in the United States, we've got 140 million people in our workforce. That's a lot of people. I would argue that most of those people on some level do relatively routine things. And by that, I, I don't mean that they do rote repetitive things exactly the same again and again, but they do things that are predictable based on what they've done in the past. They come to work and they t tend to face the same kinds of uh, challenges. And that's really been the nature of the work for most people historically. Uh, if you look back in 1900, people may have been doing routine work on a farm. By 1950, that same worker might have been doing relatively routine work, perhaps on an assembly line in a factory. And today, a typical worker might be working in a, a store like Walmart or might be doing a relatively routine white collar job. But the important point is that in every case, they're doing things that are routine and predictable. And information technology, and in particular machine learning, is really gonna impact 
those jobs across the board. And so that's one of the reasons that I really think we're headed for a big disruption this time that's quite different than the specialized impact that we saw in, in agriculture, for example. Another important point to keep in mind is that we do have this process of creative destruction going on. And again, the skeptic will say, okay, it may be that this technology will impact the industries that we have today and perhaps eliminate a lot of jobs. But of course, we know that technology will also create new industries. There will be new things that will arise in the future, including perhaps some things that we can't imagine. Uh, it's fairly easy to imagine some of the new industries that are gonna be important. Things like nanotechnology, synthetic biology, uh, virtual reality. These, these undoubtedly are going to be very influential, important, profitable industries. But I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that while they may be very important industries, they're not going to be very labor intensive. They're not going to create huge numbers of jobs, and in particular, not large numbers of jobs, again, for average people with average capabilities. What I'm showing here is an indication of, of what's happening already. This compares General Motors at its peak employment in 1979 with Google in 2012. And you can see that uh, Google had less than 5% of the number of workers that General Motors had. And yet, in inflation-adjusted terms, it actually generated 20% more in terms of earnings. So it's become this incredibly profitable, um, influential, important company but it simply does not create many jobs. And it's important to note that uh, the nature of the jobs are also quite different. I mean, General Motors created huge numbers of jobs for average people. Google creates a much smaller number of jobs for very elite people. Many of the people um, have extraordinarily advanced educations and, and specialized skills and so forth. So I think that this is really indicative of what the future is, like, is likely to look like. Uh, I think that going forward, the whole economy is likely to look a lot more like Google and a lot less like General Motors. The big risk that we face in terms of employment is that as information technology and artificial intelligence scales across traditional industries, things like manufacturing, things like uh, retail, things like food service, hospitality, these are the industries that really employ the bulk of our workforce now. As those get disrupted, there will be new industries that will arise, but they probably won't hire many people. There simply won't be many jobs there. And as a result, it's very difficult to see how the industries of the future are going to absorb all of these traditional uh, jobs that get disrupted. This is showing, again, the, the idea of creative destruction, but from a slightly different perspective. This is in terms of occupations. One of the things that you will very often hear people say is that technology creates entirely new times of, of work. Uh, you'll hear People say that you know, if you go back 50 or 100 years, the people back then would not possibly have been able to imagine all these new occupations that we have today. And that's certainly true. I mean, you can imagine, you, you can think of some things very easily that, that people just a few decades ago would not have been able to foresee. Website designers, uh, social media marketers, data scientists, and so forth. These are all entirely new types of work. But what I'm showing here is that they turn out to be very few in number relative to our entire workforce. It turns out that the vast majority of people work in traditional occupations. Uh, it's things like driving vehicles, doing clerical work in offices, working in retail stores, working in food service and preparation, working in factories. These are the occupations that, that really employ nearly everyone in our economy. And all of these new jobs, the social media marketers and, and website designers and the app designers and so forth, certainly exist, but they simply aren't very large in number. So again, as you look at this, it be, it, a, as you look ahead to when all these traditional occupations are, are disrupted by technology, and that's something that, that many people foresee happening over the next couple of decades, uh, you know, there will be an entirely new roles created, but it's, it's very hard to believe that there will be enough of them to impact, to uh, absorb all the impacted workers. So, again, I think that that's a real issue going forward. So let me now review with you some of the actual data, and this is taken from the United States, which, um, you know, is a large economy and it's also relatively unregulated relative to what we see in Europe, so I think it's a fairly good indication of, of um, what we're going to see as technology impacts. Uh, what you're seeing here is a comparison of productivity versus hourly compensation for average workers in the United States. And you can see that 
the first part of this graph, the two lines are very tightly correlated. And if you were to pick up any economics textbook, it would tell you that this is the way things are supposed to work. Productivity, of course, is the value of what we produce divided by the number of hours to produce it. And the way things are supposed to work is that as productivity increases as a result of technological progress, that should make workers more valuable so that those workers in turn can command higher wages. And as a result of that, increasing productivity creates a, a kind of general prosperity that really scales across the entire workforce. And that's exactly what happened during the post-war period in the United States right up until around 1973. But, and around that time, something happened. And clearly, these two lines have decoupled. And hourly compensation has flattened out. It's completely stagnated. Well, productivity has, has continued its relentless rise. And so what this suggests is that something quite dramatic happened. And I think that part of that story is that the nature of machines are, is changing. It, it may be that uh, where once machines were tools used by workers that made those workers more productive and more valuable, now in many cases machines are evolving to become autonomous. Rather than complementing and making workers more valuable, they're actually increasingly substituting for workers and in some cases making those workers less valuable. And in fact, some groups of workers in the US in real inflation adjusted terms earn less today than they did in the mid 1970s. Uh, so this, this is really the story to some extent of inequality and it, really what it's saying is that the fruits of innovation and of progress are really being captured by business owners and managers and by investors and not by average workers anymore. And I think it has a lot to do with the structural shift that's been going on um, with technology. This shows us the same kind of phenomenon from a slightly different perspective. This is the share of national income which is captured by labor as opposed to capital. And it used to be that labor's share was thought by economists to, to be relatively constant. And you can see, again, that during the post-war period, it's, it seems to gyrate around roughly 65% or so. But then again, uh, starting in the 1970s, it goes into kind of a gradual decline. And then around the turn of the century, it goes into a really quite a steep free, free fall. And you, you've seen it, it we've really seen uh, dramatic declines in the share of national income going to workers. And so what this is essentially saying is that labor is becoming more valuable relative to labor, I'm sorry, that the capital is becoming more valuable relative to labor and is capturing more and more of the income. And again, I think this is an indication that uh, capital is, is becoming more capable. Technology is becoming more capable and in many cases substituting for what we used to pay people to do. Uh, now it must be said that there are many alternate explanations for this. Technology is one explanation and it's the one that I tend to believe is most important, but there are certainly other things you can point to. You can point to globalization. You can point to the fact that at least in the United States, we've had a significant political change. We've become more conservative. One thing that's happened in the US is, is that we have almost completely destroyed organized labor in the private sector. So unions are now very, very weak. And as a result of that, workers have less bargaining power. So that could be a potential explanation for this. There have also been studies showing that financialization or the growth of the financial sector has also been associated with this. So there are many different theories put forward as to why this is happening. But I think that if you look at the evidence kind of holistically that the technology really stands out as, as being the, a primary cause. Uh, what you see here is the same phenomenon, uh, labor share, but on a global basis. And here you see it in several countries, including Germany. And you can see that uh, pretty much across the board in every country we're seeing this decline. And these are all quite dramatically different countries in terms of their political systems. In Germany, for example, organized labor is still you know, a, a powerful force. Uh, Japan is quite different polit politically from the United States. China, of course, is the country that, that many people associate with globalization. They assume that that's where all the jobs are going. And yet we see that there, the decline in labor share has been even steeper than in the US. So this is clearly a global phenomenon. It's something that's really happening throughout the world. And I think that that's pretty good indication that it's really a force that, that extends globally. And I think that force is technology. Here is what uh, job creation looks like in the United States over the past few decades. And you can see that decade by decade, going back to the 1960s, just about every 
decade produced fewer jobs in percentage terms than the decade before. The only exception is the 1990s, which just barely met the same level as the 1980s. But of course, the 1990s were a, a period of, you know, during the, the technology job boom in the United States. So even with that huge boom that we saw as a result of the internet in the second part of the 1990s, that decade just barely managed to keep up with the preceding decade. This last decade, uh, the first decade of this century was just a total disaster in terms of job creation. There were actually no jobs at all created. And that's largely, of course, because of the massive recession and financial crisis that we had. Um, but if you look at the last visible bar on this graph, that's showing job creation just through 2007, in other words, right before the financial crisis hit. So I think what that indicates is that even if you imagine a scenario where that financial crisis had not occurred, this pattern still would have held. We still would have seen relatively weak uh, job creation in that first decade of this century. And so clearly, again, I think this is a strong indication that we're seeing some sort of a structural change, that technology is having an, an impact and, and uh, the economy is simply getting less and less effective at creating new jobs. This graph, uh, almost looks like the mirror image of that one. And this is showing what's happening with our jobless recoveries. Uh, it turns out that when we have a recession in the United States, millions of jobs are, of course, lost. But it's taking longer and longer for the economy to get back to where it was. In other words, for employment to return to the same level. It's almost as though the job market is, is kind of losing its elasticity or its, or its ability to spring back. Uh, again, some kind of a structural shift is happening. This last jobless recovery as a result of the Great Recession was just epic. It was a monstrous jobless recovery. It extended from, uh, from the beginning of the recession. It took about six years before we got to the same employment level. So it's taking longer and longer for the jobs to come back, but there's also something else interesting happening, and it's that the nature of the jobs is changing. In other words, the jobs that get destroyed when, in, when a recession happens are not the same as the jobs that reappear when recovery finally rolls around. Uh, it turns out that the first jobs to get vaporized when recession hits are really the good, solid, middle-class jobs. These are jobs that require a moderate skill level. They very often are doing relatively routine things. They're jobs that, that pay well, that have very reliable incomes and support a good middle-class lifestyle. As soon as the recession comes along, those jobs get hit really hard. They disappear. And then when, we, when the recovery finally does come, those jobs don't really reappear. It turns out that, that companies find that they can leverage technology and avoid rehiring those workers. And so what we've seen in the United States is that, that the jobs that do reappear are largely low-wage jobs in the service sector. They're relatively undesirable jobs. They're often part-time jobs. They don't pay well. They often don't have very good benefits. Uh, they often don't require particularly high skill levels. So what we've seen is that the, the the overall quality of the job market is really kind of diminishing. In addition to those lower skilled jobs, there are also a fewer number of, of really high skilled jobs, but those jobs you know, really require a lot of education, at a minimum a college degree or a university degree, and very often even more than that. Um, so those jobs are not necessarily accessible to, uh, to the broad base of our workers, and of course they're, they're much fewer in number. We've seen that they're really uh, especially in this last recovery from the Great Recession, it's really been these low-wage, kind of lousy jobs that uh, really have, have been the lion's share of what we've seen created. And one thing that I think is really important to, to keep in mind is that a lot of these jobs are in areas like fast food, working for McDonald's, they're in areas like retail, working for Walmart, um, and these are all jobs that are likely to be susceptible to, to automation going forward. So. As it stands right now, we can say that at least these relatively undesirable jobs are being created. But as we look forward to the next couple of decades, I think that, that it's a very high risk that even those, these jobs um, are going to become much harder to, um, to generate. So I again, I think that's potentially a real issue for employment going forward. So let me uh, describe for you some of the actual technologies that I think are, are really kind of disrupting this. Uh, robots, of course, have been around for a long time. I mean, you know, robotic automation in factories is, is really nothing new. 
But if you look at the kind of industrial robots used in automotive plants, for example, they tend to be very tightly choreographed. They're highly dependent on precise timing and positioning. You know, these are robots that expect a part to be in just the right place at just the right time, then they can pick that part up and they can do extraordinary things with it. You know, they're, they're very fast and precise and, and so forth. So one implication of all of that is that if you look at advanced co economies like Germany or, or the United States, uh, nearly all of the absolutely rote, repetitive assembly line type jobs are already automated. Uh, those jobs have already disappeared um, as a result of industrial automation. Uh, so the jobs that are left for people are those jobs that to some degree are unpredictable. In other words, it's, it's very often jobs that rely on qualities like visual perception or hand-eye coordination and dexterity. These are, these are things at which human beings excel and, and it very often involves going into environments that are relatively unpredictable or where the lighting may not be consistent and so forth. And these have all been areas where so far the robots have not been able to take over this work. And examples might include loading and unloading boxes at the beginning and end of the production process or perhaps picking parts from a bin and then feeding that part into the next stage of the production process. Those types of things are, are still largely done by people. Uh, what I'm showing in this photograph is, is one example of a machine that is finally beginning to encroach on that final frontier, on, on, on the areas that so far have been really limited to people. This is a, a robot built by a company called Industrial Perception in Silicon Valley. And it's a startup company, but it's actually now owned by Google. A, a couple of years ago, Google bought uh, 10 or 12 robotics companies, and this was one of them. But this is a robot that's focused specifically on moving boxes. And you can see in this photograph that it's approaching this stack of boxes, and the boxes aren't stacked precisely. Uh, they're different colors, different sizes, and orientations, and so forth. And this robot moves these boxes using machine vision. It actually is able to uh, approach these boxes, even in environments where the lighting might not be consistent and so forth and it basically is able to pick up the boxes and move them. The company uh, projects that eventually this machine will be able to move about a box every second, and that's, uh, that would compare to a box every six seconds or so for a particularly productive human workers. And this, obviously, this is a machine that's never gonna get tired, it's never gonna get injured, it's never going to file a workers' compensation claim. So I think it's easy to see as this technology scales out and becomes more affordable that it's gonna be very disruptive to the large number of people that depend on jobs of this type. And so that, that's you know, potentially a, a real problem, especially for those workers. Now, there is a very conventional view about the way things work, and, and, and many people would say, you know what, working on a loading dock, lifting boxes all day is not a very good job. And so we should not be particularly concerned if a robot takes that job. In fact, we should celebrate that, and, and we should be happy that the workers who are now doing that are gonna be freed up, you'll very often hear that phrase, freed up, to pursue something higher on the skills ladder. And, and so the solution to this kind of impact from technology has always been that you take these relatively unskilled workers and you send them back to school for more training, uh, more education, and as a result of that, they can hopefully move up the skills ladder, do something more um, elaborate, something that requires uh, more skill. Perhaps, for example, they might work in an office and then they would have a better work environment. They wouldn't have to worry about being injured, moving boxes around and so forth. And so that can be a very positive thing. Uh, this shows the, the problem with that assumption, I think, going forward. Uh, and, and the basic idea here is that machines increasingly are coming for the more skilled jobs as well. Uh, what you see here is an article that was uh, in the Wall Street Journal just recently, just a few months ago, and it's talking about the impact of automation in white collar jobs in the corporate finance departments of large corporations. And you can see from this graph that the headcount in, in that department, and that would include jobs like financial planning, accounting, uh, accounts payable and receivable, um, and so forth, the, the headcount of you know, the number of people employed in, that, in those departments uh, relative to corporate revenues has collapsed by about 40% over the last decade. So nearly half of those jobs have disappeared and it's all been the result of smart software, which is increasingly taking on those roles. And I, I think that right now it's largely been a story of more routine clerical type jobs, especially 
in areas like accounts payable and receivable and so forth, but we are seeing these uh, technologies getting dramatically more powerful and begin to impact on even more skilled um, labor. And uh, again, that the thing that's really driving this is machine learning. This machine learning technology is being applied really across the board, it's becoming more capable. And there are really two things driving the, the impact of that. One is that, we're, that the algorithms themselves are becoming much better. And, and in particular, we've seen uh, a lot of breakthroughs in an area called deep learning, which is a sort of a refinement of neural networks, an idea that's been around a long time. But deep learning is, is a way to build much more sophisticated neural networks with many layers. And we've seen some truly remarkable breakthroughs there. We now have uh, systems that can in some cases recognize images with more precision than human beings. Uh, Microsoft has demonstrated its Skype translation system, which is actually able to translate spoken language in real time uh, between languages, which is almost you know, a science fiction type thing. It's something that, that you can remember seeing in Star Trek. Um, I just saw recently there was an article about some research, researchers that trained a deep learning algorithm to learn to play chess in about 72 hours and the system after, after those three days was able to play at a grand master level. So this is really an area where we're seeing remarkable breakthroughs. And so we're seeing a, a lot of innovation in the actual algorithms themselves and the other thing that's driving it is that there's now such a huge amount of data out there. So as a result of the whole big data phenomenon and the fact that organizations are just collecting a colossal amount of data on nearly all of their operations, there is essentially a, a, this, this feedstock out there for these algorithms. So uh, these two, there's kind of a synergy between the, um, the fact that the algorithms are getting better and the fact that there's so much data out there for them to operate on and, and to train, train them. So I think that going forward, that's gonna be really disruptive. You can see the impact of that in a number of areas already. Uh, E-discovery is an um, example of al algorithms that are deployed in the legal field. And it used to be that lawyers and paralegals had to go through paper documents manually and figure out which ones were relevant to court cases. Now that's largely being done algorithmically. So there are a lot of impact on work there. Um, another area that's, that's really seeing a big impact is journalism. There are smart systems that are able to write news stories. And by one account, uh, every 30 seconds or so you see a completely autonomously driven uh, news story appear uh, in the media. And there are some big, big media companies that are relying more and more on this technology and uh, not all of them are happy to disclose that but it's becoming more and more of a phenomenon. And right now it's more formulaic areas, it's uh, financial reporting and sports reporting and so forth but these systems are getting better and better. They have the ability to tap into a data stream, figure out what's particularly important or interesting about that data, and then weave that together into quite a compelling narrative. And uh, this is something that will be disruptive, not just in journalism, but really across white collar jobs in general. You can think of all these knowledge workers that are out there sitting in cubicles, sitting in front of a computer, perhaps writing relatively formulaic reports or analysis. All of those people are gonna be dramatically impacted by this kind of technology going forward. So a lot of jobs are at risk there. I'll give you just one example of a, a company that I became aware of uh, through a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and I think it offers a very vivid illustration of the kind of potential impact that uh, we may see going forward. It's a company called WorkFusion, and it's located in the New York area, but what they offer is a smart platform that offers a combination of direct automation plus uh, crowdsourcing. And you can imagine some large company, perhaps in the financial service areas, that previously had employed a lot of clerical workers to keep information updated, for example, as part of the due diligence process. So they will take this project and give it to this company, and they will use their smart platform to essentially analyze all of this work, and then they will essentially get rid of all those internal clerical workers who are all people that have you know, relatively good jobs and replace them with a combination of direct automation and freelance workers that are part of the, the so-called on-demand or gig economy. And this, is an, this smart platform can autonomously recruit and manage these workers. For example, it will 
automatically post job listings on platforms like Craigslist or Elance. It will recruit the workers, it will manage the workers, it will, it will monitor them, it can even um, look at metrics like the speed at which they type and so forth and, and manage and evaluate them. It can escalate problems if one particular freelance worker can't do a particular task. It can escalate this to someone else who can do it. So it completely automates the management level and, and also gets rid of the, the people that normally would manage all of these workers. And it replaces all these good solid middle class jobs with some smaller numbers of people that, that just you know, work on demand. Uh, but the interesting thing is the story doesn't even end there. It turns out that as these freelance workers go about their, their assigned tasks uh, under the direction of this smart system, the system is actually watching and learning and its machine learning algorithms are analyzing what the workers are doing and actually essentially learning to replace them over time. So, and that's what the company calls incremental automation. So in effect, these freelancers are, are essentially training their own replacement as you know, this machine learning just gets better and better. So I think there's, you can imagine that sort of scaling across organizations across the economy, how that can really be quite disruptive and, and really just impact an enormous number of jobs. Uh, this is showing uh, earnings for, for university graduates in the United States, and you can see that they've actually been declining over the last decade or so. So I think this is, again, very indicative that uh, you know, something quite disruptive is happening. Again, the conventional wisdom has always been that education uh, pays off as a result of technology, that, that, that as technology advances, higher skills become more valuable and, and therefore university graduates should actually be better off. But, you can, but what we're seeing is, is actually the opposite. Their, their earnings are falling. And so I think that a lot of this has to do with the fact that machines, smart algorithms are, are climbing the skills ladder. Uh, you know, it turns out that it's not just people that can become more skilled. Uh, computer algorithms are doing that too, and they're beginning increasingly to impact on the types of jobs taken by people who graduate from, from university. So, you, I mean, it, it remains true that it's much better to graduate from university than not to. Uh, you know, university graduates still earn much more than people who don't have that, that advanced degree. But the reality is that it's, it's not because uh, university graduates are seeing these incredible opportunities. The reality is that it's because opportunities for those who don't have that education are really just collapsing. So uh, the differential is still there, but the story in terms of the people who are actually getting this education is really not as promising as we would hope for. So again, I think that's a pretty strong indication that we're moving into a world where even the most skilled workers are likely to be increasingly impacted by artificial intelligence. So an important question for, for this group is, how does all of this relate to the industrial internet of things? And I think that the answer to that is that IoT is going to be a dramatically important platform for artificial intelligence. It's gonna become one of the most important mechanisms by which all of this scales across organizations and across the whole economy. Uh, in my latest book, Rise of the Robots, I give uh, one good real world example that I think is already in place and I think is really kind of a, a precursor of, of what the industrial of Internet of Things is, is really going to look like. And it involves uh, a company called Redbox in the United States which makes kiosks to rent uh, videos. And it turns out that all these kiosks are connected via the Internet. And as a result, the, the maintenance and, and uh, supply of these machines just takes a tiny number of people relative to what we've seen in the past. Uh, for example, if one of the machines jams, uh, a technician can log on remotely, can find out exactly what's happening, and then can often jiggle the mechanism and cause the, the jam to be fixed without actually visiting that facility. Um, so the whole management and, and resupply and maintenance of these machines is just, it takes dramatically less labor than it would if it were done in a traditional way. And I, you know, I think that that's what we're going to see increasingly with, with uh, industrial equipment across the board. I think that the other thing that will happen is that it will become more and more autonomous. We're gonna see artificial intelligence and smart algorithms deployed across this platform. One way that, that I tend to view of it is you can, you can look at what's happening now with the massive data centers that companies like Amazon and Google and, and Apple maintain. 
you've got these huge computing facilities, and um, they're very often billion-dollar facilities, but the number of jobs is actually tiny. It's often, you know, something like 50, 50 jobs in this massive, massive facility. And this is largely because of automation. You've got tens of thousands of computers that are just managed autonomously by these smart algorithms. And so I think you can kind of think of that as a model for what the industrial internet of things can look like in the future as more and more equipment becomes connected and managed remotely, managed autonomously, um, constant, subject to constant diagnosis and, and monitoring and, and very often autonomous uh, repair and so forth. So I think that you know, it's pretty clear that, that this is going to drive this whole phenomenon in terms of smart algorithms and software taking over more and more of the things that people are now doing. So I think that going forward, this will be an accelerator of this, this entire uh, process. So one thing that, that I think is really important to keep in mind and to focus on that, that right now economists are not talking much about is the fact that if we are really going to move into a future where fewer people have jobs or where perhaps wages are driven down significantly by technology, then it means that we're going to have fewer people out there who are capable of buying the products and services produced by the economy. And in a market economy and capitalism, that's, that's a critical issue. We've got to have people who can purchase the things that are being produced. That's where demand comes from. Uh, you know, and as, as people begin to struggle economically, either through outright unemployment or through not having much discretionary income, it's, it's very easy to see how we could get into a kind of stagnation or even a downward economic spiral where you get into sort of a deflationary scenario where businesses find it harder and harder to sell what they're producing and begin cutting prices or perhaps laying off even more workers and the whole thing then becomes sort of a negative spiral. I think that that's a, a genuine, genu genuine risk if we don't make the appropriate adaptation to this. Uh, you can think of this as the kind of inequality that we all that we already see. Uh, think in terms, for example, of someone like Bill Gates. Bill Gates is a billionaire. In theory, he can buy anything he wants. And yet the reality is that he's not going to just go out and buy and buy. Obviously, uh, a billionaire is not going to buy a thousand automobiles. Uh, a billionaire is not going to buy a thousand smartphones, and he's certainly not going to sit down and eat a thousand restaurant meals in one night. So you can see that when you, you undertake this process of essentially taking purchasing power from a thousand average people and then concentrating all of that into the hands of one very wealthy person that you really take a lot out of the economy. You diminish demand. There are fewer people out there who can really buy what's being produced. And I think that that's going to be really quite a critical issue as this unfolds over the next couple of decades. I also think that there's some evidence to suggest that it may be an issue already. You I think especially here in Europe, you hear the word deflation a lot. Uh, you've heard economists talking about secular stagnation, which is a process um, where, where there simply isn't enough investment opportunity out there because there, aren't, there isn't really sufficient demand. Um, so, so in some cases, you're already seeing that this is a phenomenon. You see a, a lot of talk of the fact that there's not enough demand out there and there's too much supply. And uh, I think that if you look at what's been happening, even in the United States, there's some indication that this is already becoming an issue. This graph shows a comparison of retail sales versus corporate profits since recovery from the Great Recession in the US. And uh, you know, as you, you may have heard, corporate f profitability since recovery from the recession has been extraordinary. I mean, we've had historical, unprecedented levels of corporate profits. but for the most part, those corporate profits are coming from efficiency improvements. They're coming from corporations becoming more efficient, very often from cutting workers, reducing costs. And by and large, those, corp those profits are not coming from selling more stuff. Uh, and yet, you know, as we look forward, that's clearly unsustainable. You can't have ongoing corporate soaring profits purely as a result of cost cutting. That obviously has a, has a fundamental limit to it. Eventually, you have got to be able to sell more of what you are producing. And uh, if you don't you know, do that, then, it, then it's very hard to see how that becomes sustainable. So I think that eventually, we're going to have to figure out how to make sure we have an economy that, that creates sufficient demand if we want to continue to have um, corporations being health going, healthy going forward. So finally, um, 
the question becomes, what should we do about this? You know, what in, in the far future, thinking over the next couple of decades, if this really becomes an issue, then what should we focus on? What should be the solution? And I think that ultimately we're gonna face a choice. It's very easy to imagine a very utopian scenario. Uh, and very often you will hear people in Silicon Valley talk about that a lot. You can imagine a future where no one has to do a dangerous job, no one has to do a really unpleasant job or a boring job or a job that they really hate. You can imagine a future where technology takes on more and more of that, and as a result, people have more free time, more time to spend with their families, more leisure, more time to focus on things that they find genuinely rewarding and so forth. But clearly that can happen only if we solve this distributional problem. It can happen only if people have an income. If, if we don't solve that and people are left in genuinely dire straits, especially in the United States where we don't have the kind of social safety net that you have here in Europe, um, then it's easy to imagine a much more dystopian scenario, a you know, a, uh, a scenario where people are generally under tremendous economic stress and, and perhaps uh, really cannot maintain a middle class lifestyle. Uh, so I think that going forward, there are a couple of things that we're gonna have to do. One is to recognize that technology is gonna move faster and faster. And even if you don't buy into this idea entirely about how machines may eventually really create a massive disruption, I think most people would agree that because of the, the speed of the disruption, a lot of people are gonna have trouble adjusting and, and retraining for whatever opportunities are out there. And as a result of that, I do think it's important that we enhance our social safety net to make sure that we can take care of those people who are impacted. But if we look far enough into the future, I'm thinking now in terms of decades from now, uh, even that may not be enough. We may have to fundamentally restructure our economy. And I think that what we're gonna have to do is decouple income from traditional jobs. And we're gonna have to create some sort of a scenario where everyone, whether or not they have access to a traditional job will have access to a, a decent income so that they can survive economically and also so that they can act as a consumer and help provide the demand that we need to, to drive the, the economy. So I think that this idea of some sort of a guaranteed basic income is, is something that eventually we may have to look at and it's obviously an extraordinarily radical idea uh, in more conservative countries like the US it's almost unthinkable politically and yet that's the paradox I think that on the one hand it's almost unthinkable on the other hand it's almost inevitable that that's the direction that we're going to have to move into so my purpose in talking about this is really to get people thinking about it and also to I, I hope help initiate a conversation I do think that this is likely to be a critically important issue it's something that we should all start thinking about and talking about and hopefully as a result of that conversation, some real solutions will develop so that we can ensure that the, the impact of, of all of this amazing progress that I think we're gonna see over the next couple of decades is gonna be prosperity that is broadly shared rather than simply being hoovered up by just a tiny number of people at the top. We wanna make sure that the prosperity that we create is, is really shared broadly. I, I think that that's gonna be something that's just a critically important future uh, issue for the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>